We officially welcome you to the online climate economic conference that is organized by Energy, Environment and Climate Change. That is the ECC vertical of Pune International Center. PIC is a think tank in its 10th year, which focuses on public policy research advocacy in diverse areas like technology, social innovation, governance, national security, social sciences, as well as energy, environment, and climate change. I would now like to invite Professor Malik to please give his welcome remarks to open up the conference and also invite and share a little bit of brief introduction to Dr. Rajiv Kumar for his inaugural address. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I'm Amitabh Malik. Let me very cordially welcome all those who have joined in and particularly the invited speakers to this PIC Climate Economic Conference on the topic of energy, environment, and economic growth, emerging challenges. So uh, we begin with an address by none other than the Vice Chairman of the Niti IO, uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar. As luck would have it, he had to be traveling today at this time. So we have recorded his message, a full 18 minute uh, address. And we will start with that. But before that, let me say a few words of introduction. Although I think everybody knows Dr. Rajiv Kumar. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar is a renowned Indian economist who served as the economic advisor to the Department of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance from 1992 to 1995. And he also served as a senior fellow to the Center for Policy Research Delhi from 2012 to 2017. Dr. Kumar is the Chancellor of the Gokhale Institute of Economics and Politics in Pune, and he is the founding director of the Pahle India Foundation, a non-profit research organization that specializes in policy-oriented policy research and analysis. And that's what we also try to do at PIC. Of course, we all know that Dr. Rajiv Kumar is currently serving as the Vice Chairman of the Indian IO. Practically, he is the boss of the Indian IO today. And we are very fortunate to have him with us through this recording. So, Siddharth, could you please start the recording? Namaskar, uh, and um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Amitabh uh, Malik, Dr. Kelkar, my former boss, Dr. Mashelkar, and all the trustees of the Pune International Centre. Uh, my heartiest congratulations to you for um, organizing this unique uh, Triple E E3 conference on energy, environment, and economy. Uh, on, this is this is an issue uh, which uh, needs all our attention, and uh, and it, it cannot be overemphasized how much uh, you require to focus on if you like, this triple bottom line. Uh, because uh, without this focusing on this triple bottom line, I don't think uh, we will be able to achieve either our growth targets or even our uh, the aspirations of our younger generation. Because we are really, if you don't focus on them, uh, we are really uh, using up our future, uh, which we will hand over uh, to our young next generations. And that's just simply uh, not, uh, not, not feasible, not, neither desirable. Uh, so, so once more, uh, congratulations to the Pune International Centre for organising this, and especially uh, to Mr. Malik, uh, who is the spirit behind this. I think it's uh, um, the most uh, um, the, the most necessary focus that we have today uh, on, on on the development agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, um, climate change is a reality. Uh, irrespective of what anybody might say and what the outgoing president of the United States may have said and what some other, if you like, Philistines might claim or argue, it is a reality, it is upon us, it's, um, it's, um, uh, it's something that you cannot deny. Uh, the overshoot day, the earth overshoot day uh, happened on July, 17, July 19, 2017 and we know that if we carry on with business as usual, uh, we will uh, we will not uh, have a planet to live on, and I think that's uh, that's something that we all need to be conscious of. 
we also need to be conscious all that climate change and preventing uh, irreparable, irreversible damage to our environment is a public good, is a global public good. So we can't do it alone. We have to all come together, uh, each one of us. And uh, within our country, I think all our, every citizen of this country is a, a stakeholder in this, uh, in this uh, uh, movement uh, for preventing uh, further climate damage as we go on. Uh, so therefore, I think the more we can spread this awareness, uh, the more we can take it to every child in every school, uh, the better off we will be because I think it is through them that we'll be able to educate even our older generations who sometimes overlook uh, the, the, the necessity for uh, balancing environment with our needs uh, because uh, in their own quest for a higher level of living. But we must recognize that uh, the higher level of living, our own development goals and agenda uh, now faces a real carbon constraint. Carbon constraint is a binding constraint. It's not and a binding constraint in economic terms is defined as one which has to be addressed if you need to achieve your objective function, if you need to uh, you know, achieve your goals. And carbon constraint, therefore, is a binding constraint. And our development model must take full cognizance of it, uh, both in the industry and in the government circles. And I think it's equally, the responsibility is equally shared uh, between the industry and the government. And I dare say also within the civil society, because we need to change our own ways of doing things, you know, in terms of you know conserving the resources that we have, not wasting them, and 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 in sometimes actually uh, you know reverting back to our earlier practices, where recycling uh, was a tradition was, was was an inbuilt inherent practice in all households, and uh, you know where we, we we always took care of uh, planting more trees because it was said that you planted more trees for your grandchildren. And that was the model that we followed, which we have ten, which we which are tending to forget in our uh, sort of westernized consumerist you know, sort of behavior. Uh, you know, so I, I really want to say that uh, it has to become the, the the business of the government, the industry, and the civil society and our householders if we want to achieve this. Because again, like many things. Uh, we will not be able to prevent environment, irreparable environment damage unless we make uh, this uh, triple uh, conjunction as a, as, as a mass movement. As, uh, you know, as, as sometimes the Prime Minister says, unless we convert it into a Jan Andola. And I think that's, the, uh, that, that's what one of the principal messages that I want to leave is that we have to move out of our conference rooms and into the streets and into the colonies and into the localities and into the factories and the offices uh, to say that, look, this is what we need to do today uh, to safeguard our tomorrow. And I think this is uh, because, it, the, 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 but, and, and, you know, we can ignore it only at our peril at this stage. And I don't think, and, 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 and you know, the, the good thing is that our own traditions, you know, uh, militate against such neglect, our own traditions, uh, tell us to uh, you know take to to do this to take care of our nature because you know we have the concept of vasudhaya kutumbakam uh, which means that we you know our own traditions are that man lives in nature and man doesn't live to conquer nature you know which is the occidental you know uh, you know the sort of you know the way of looking at things that in terms of you know Marxism uh, ideology uh, the the final contradiction between Man uh, is that he faces between you know man against nature. That's not our way of looking at things. Our way of looking at things is uh, to balance uh, our lives, uh, you know, with nature. And we, you know, that our traditions have been that prakriti has been is one of the primary, the, one of the sort of principal, you know, um, um, uh, pillars of our existence. And I think therefore we must look back into our own traditions and say as to how man will again balance his life, her life, uh, with nature. And this is, this is very sort of possible because our own economic model, the Indian economic model, was not, is not based on uh, insatiable demands, you know, which is what Adam Smith has given us. You know, that economics is a dismal science because 
you know, limited means change unlimited demands. That's not been our model. Our model has been that of rational demands. Our model has that been of finding satisfaction in what we have and not just keep chasing, you know, material uh, consumption and material, uh, you know, uh, uh, possessions. And that's the one that we need to build today because if we do that, if we do that and if we, uh, you know, and if we glorify once again a life of, you know, balance, a life of satisfaction, a life whereby we tend to take care of the nature around us, I think we can achieve uh, what, we, what, what the conference's uh, goals are. But, but I, 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 and I say that, uh, and, you know, and, and why is this conference so important and why we are trying to, why should we focus on that, is that we don't have the luxury of spoiling the nature today and retrofitting it tomorrow. You know, we may have done it in the past. You know, we have, may have converted the river Thames into a, you know, river of uh, acid and we might have had tons of mercury in the Bay of Tokyo in the past and then we could have retrofitted it and so on. But that luxury, unfortunately, is not with us any longer because we've already reached, as it were, a tipping point. You know, you know with four tons of uh, uh, carbon already per capita and, with, you know, with, uh, with our carbon CO2, content being at 415 plus uh, particles per you know, ppm now, that's just not possible. Today we face a situation where we, if we if spoil it further, then we will tip over and we will get into these very catastrophic uh, you know, um, changes and events that we are now beginning to see. I have witnessed one myself and I want to bring that up and which is, uh, you know, the, what, what, what happened uh, to the mighty Amudarya, you know, to the, to the, to the uh, you know, uh, the Oxus River uh, by bringing, uh, you know, by extracting so much water from it uh, for a canal in Turkmenistan that the river dried up before it reached the Aral Sea. And, and that's a fact. I mean, people can go and see it. As a result of which, the southern part of the Aral Sea completely dried up because it had no, no, no supply of water any longer. And all the salts uh, that were accumulated on the bed of the Aral Sea, the southern Aral Sea, uh, became exposed to the ground and they swirled around in the environment, bringing about huge pulmonary lung-related diseases in countries like Uzbekistan and, and, and parts of Turkmenistan. So that's, we, we, we know that that will happen. And this again uh, can happen to us because, you know, we, we are now faced with a water emergency. I mean, Niti Aayog has brought this out very clearly, that if we don't take care of our water, resources, the way we use our water, there will be thousands and thousands of villages, you know, which will, where, where the aquifers will be completely spoiled, they will, you will get arsenic and fluoride, etc. So these are things which are upon us. The emergency is upon us and we don't have the luxury of saying, oh, let's go ahead and do business as usual and we'll retrofit it later on. So our development model has to create this balance between the three, the energy, the environment and the economy as we go forward. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you have uh, focused on energy uh, because uh, energy uh, does account for, uh, uh, I think, about 70% uh, of the carbon emissions uh, in the atmosphere today. And I think it also resonates very well with what our Prime Minister has said uh, since the day he took office. I mean, you know, our own nationally determined targets uh, for the Paris Conference are are, are uh, uh, you know, reflect this. They are a testimony to the fact that this government is very conscious uh, of, uh, of, of, of these problems and therefore, uh, you know, and, and also uh, the Prime Minister has moved to create a, a, a global solar alliance has been in the same direction and now his appeal uh, that there is one world and one sun and one, uh, you know, and one grid, I think, uh, uh, you know, really clearly reflects his commitment to saying that we will have to tackle this as a global public good. Imagine if we do have, if we did have one global grid, how, how, how amazingly that would affect, that would benefit all of us as we go forward. Now, the, therefore, you know, uh, but the good news, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the good news is that in the energy sector, we now have options available. We now have feasible, uh, technologically and economically, commercially feasible options available uh, to move out of uh, uh, out of the fossil-based energy model that we have lived on for the last 250 years, you know, and I and I'm glad you, you must already know 
but I am glad to report that the last bid that we have uh, for solar power came in at rupees two per kilowatt hour, you know, and two two rupees two point zero one, and which makes it uh, you know which makes it really competitive with all the thermal power generation that you can do, and even with storage for twenty four seven uh, you know power uh, availability, the bid the, the cost is about now rupees four, very close to what you will get from the very high ash content coal in our country. You know, and, and if you include the washing and the beneficiation and carbon sequestration, I think this will become cheaper. So solar power is becoming uh, becoming you know viable. Uh, we, therefore, we have ramped up the target to 450 gigawatts by 2030. I think we can even do better than that, and we can achieve not only achieve but overachieve our Paris commitments. But solar is not the only game in town. Uh, you know there is wind. Uh, just yesterday, I was taking a review. Of what is the availability for our wind energy, for our tidal energy, uh, you know, and for our waste to uh, energy uh, models. Now, I've just recently, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, supported, and I'm happy to report that the Indian Oil uh, IOC is going to put up a pilot plant to use waste, municipal waste, uh, to energy, uh, you know, plants uh, very soon. And this will this will come into uh, this will this will start producing by the end of next year. And this is a technology which which uses plasma sort of level in a, you know sort of a, to, you know uh, to raise the level temperatures to that which has been developed by our own Indians in this in, in the United States and they put up a plant already in the state of Virginia and they are putting up the plants here. So there are several options now uh, to move away uh, from fossil based energy. I mean also I think the storage technology a lot has been done and uh, there are now there is now a company. Uh, again, you know, youngsters from IITs uh, who got 12 patents where they can they, they, where they are recycling batteries and, and, and recovery levels of 95 percent, you know, and therefore lithium and cobalt and others can be available as we go forward, and we may not have to depend even on those imports. Uh, friends, I, I, because PIC is so active, I want to draw your attention uh, to hydrogen because that's the next frontier, and I think the hydrogen economy. Is going to be uh, the name, the game in town as we go forward. Niti Aayog has already organized two very, very important meetings. Uh, one of your members, Mr. Ravi Pandit, was there as, as a part of that meeting. And and I, I can I tell you that we will focus more and more on green hydrogen as we go forward, on electrolysis, uh, you know, to generate hydrogen so that it can be decentralized and can be used in our, you know, in our transport sector where a lot of energy is used. But friends, I want to appeal to you uh, to start talking to the user industries like cement, like steel. I was in conversation with the CMD of Tata Steel yesterday, and they are saying that they can you know, start injecting hydrogen in their glass furnaces. With the user industries, we have to come together to try and create the basis uh, for the hydrogen economy to raise its consumption and demand level in our economy. And I'm happy to see that there is some work already happening. Uh, Tata Energy Research Institute has brought out a very good study uh, which shows the difficulty of switching to hydrogen, but also shows the possibility and the feasibility of the hydrogen study. So I think uh, PIC uh, would do very well uh, to focus a lot more attention now on hydrogen because that's the next frontier and we want to be out there. India, India should be there, India can be there, and I think that's the frontier that we need to conquer. Friends, before I conclude, I need to draw your attention to one other thing, which is, yes, the future we will tackle. But what about trying to reduce the carbon content in the atmosphere already? Uh, can we do that? And, and I think we need to do it because I think about that otherwise by the time this happens, uh, you know, we, we come to some solutions, it might be too late. And I have found one particular method which I am pushing now in Niti IO, and I'll be addressing a FAO conference in the afternoon, which is the switch to chemical-free agriculture, which is the switch to natural farming, which is the switch to agroecology, because there is now mounting evidence, mounting hard evidence, that once you start using uh, agro agroecology, once you start, uh, once, you, once you give up chemical-based industrial farming, as it has been called, then the you can improve the soil carbon content of the soil. Now there are there are fields after fields uh, where this evidence is being collected by agricultural universities. I have now in 
conversation with 18 of them and that's the that's the way to go uh, that's the way to do carbon sequestration uh, you know in a natural way without without reducing our productivity or yields so natural farming which is which has been propagated by somebody quite close to pune uh, subhash palekar ji uh, from 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 amravati is not so close but he but lots of practices are being done in maharashtra and nasik and so on again i think the ic will do very well uh, to focus on the environmental advantages benefits consequences of shift to natural farming to chemical free farming because that's the way that's the only option in my view at the moment to try and bring back uh, as it were the carbon uh, in, uh, concentration in our atmosphere i think uh, we in india uh, have the talent we have the capability we have the commitment uh, to be able to achieve this triple bottom line and i once again congratulate mr malik and the pune international center for organizing this conference and focusing on this very important issue thank you very much thank you very much sir for such a wonderful and inspiring inaugural address i would now like to introduce dr amitabh malik who is the convener for the conference so the ecc vertical is led by professor amitabh malik and it was started in 2018 it focuses on climate policy and outreach for climate action a founder member and trustee of pune international center he is also the convener for the conference a padma shri awardee for his work in laser technology professor malik is a defense scientist who has been actively working in energy environment and climate change for almost two decades i would now like to kindly request professor malik to speak a few words and set the tone for the agenda for the conference yes uh, thank you sir dar uh, that was a wonderful opener from professor rajiv kumar who gave us such a comprehensive understanding of where we stand and how precarious it is for us to start our work for climate action and for repairing the economy together so i have 10 minutes to share some thoughts as an introduction as a as a setting the agenda so first of all of course our intention is to find correlation interrelation between the energy dynamics environmental stability and economic progress mankind is already uh, struggling in what we call the climate challenge world with multiple simultaneous disruptions both environmental and economic for years we were under the impression that protecting the environment would be a impediment for economic growth economic progress but that is no longer true because thanks to technology and innovation we now have the combined capacity for sustained economic performance while also reducing the climate risks both simultaneously chasing the gdp growth at the cost of earth resources is not is, is no longer viable also the earth temperature getting warmer than 2 degree centigrade which are the industrial industrial average is also not acceptable even for economic progress so we also know that what is going on today the emissions have not slowed down so any further global warming will certainly destabilize the environment to almost irreversibly and consequent climate disasters and economic recoveries will cost a huge amount of money uh, it is said by researchers that every dollar invested today on climate action will provide over five times benefits by 2030 just matter of 10 years so i am feel like asking a question can climate change or climate change crisis be recognized as a blessing in disguise will that unite mankind to live in peace with the nature and with each other we are almost at that kind of a crossroad yeah another dimension of the typically functions that we are talking about is the interdependence of, of the human health and well being 
particularly for the young generation of today and tomorrow, that will have to face up with a very um, trying future. The Earth environment is not stabilized quickly. It would shrink the comfort zone of mankind. Normal life will be dominated by, by struggle for survival with hardly any time or energy for economic progress. And that's exactly what we saw during the recent COVID disruption. Climate economic impact will be different for different nations, different regions, creating extreme tension and uneven societal stress that will cause conflict, even wars. Post COVID economic recovery presents a great opportunity for us to make a course correction, if I may call it, for moving towards a more resilient and green economic strategy. We are talking about changing our mindset for doing something very differently. This decade is the only opportunity that we have, and this is what many people have said. Unless we do that, we are going to face a very bad situation. And building such a future starts with smart spending from today. Of course, money is required, but the money must be channelized in the smart spending. So climate economics is a, is a word that we are talking about. I'm not sure whether it's how, how correct, but what we mean is that the climate change or the environmental destabilization is affecting the economic resilience, economic progress, and that's the topic we are talking about. So root cause today is actually the unrealistic economic aspirations. That has been, that is what has been driving the mankind, the civilization, modern civilization, to where we are today. World Bank estimates that pollution in India is costing the country over 55 billion dollars per year. Climate related events across the globe in 2018 caused total loss of about 350 billion. Globally, 87% of the cities are in breach of WHO air pollution guidelines, which means billions worldwide are actually exposed to dirty air, toxic emissions due to burning of fossil fuels. Investing in low carbon economy, low carbon solutions for the transport sector alone can save 2.8 gigatons of carbon emission by 2050, providing direct economic benefits of the order of $10.5 trillion by 2050. Land use reform alone can deliver about 30% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030 stopping deforestation and restoring forests can can of course cost something quite a lot 7 billion but then by 2030 if we actually do that it can remove 7 billion tons of co2 which is equivalent to removing something like 1.5 billion cars from the road restoring 350 million hectares of degraded land could cost about 23 um, to 67 billion dollars. However, it could also deliver an estimated 170 billion dollars in economic benefit. So the, the, the balance is always now weighing for economic progress only with climate civilization, environmental civilization. Finally, investing in new technology and practices can significantly reduce upfront costs of sustainable infrastructure benefiting both rich and the poor. So if we look at some of the facts of the uh, economic facts, climate action investment to about 23 trillion is emerging market by 23, uh, 2030. Land use reforms alone can deliver about 30% reduction in greenhouse gases. Nearly 60, 50 countries have now committed to using 
only renewable energy by 2050. Business community is also accelerating efforts to reduce climate change impacts. Under 30 institutional investors, representing about 17 trillion in assets, are now calling for capital markets and regulators to improve climate visibility, climate performance visibility, and risk detection, risk disclosure. Renewals are likely to take a makeup of two thirds, that is, 60% of the to total uh, global investment in new power plants, and that will become the single, single largest uh, additional energy by 2040. Investing in new technologies and practices can significantly reduce upfront cost. The stable earth environment has now been instrumental in all our progress, but now the unforeseen impacts are threatening that same stability. Balancing economic and environmental compulsions have now become extremely crucial for protecting human well being and sustaining economic progress. I was almost tempted to say that, of course, climate crisis is serious, but even if the climate crisis were not so serious, today we are at a crossroad where for saving our economy, saving our economic progress, maintaining our progress forward, we need to change our way of doing. Um, therefore, hopefully this conference will lead us to some discussion towards uh, defining the contours of the integrated climate economic policy that can address not just the urgent need of a sustainable economic recovery, which is what we are trying to do, but it should also support a new green growth pathway. Um, without this, and if we don't do this, life on Earth will be very difficult for the young generation of today, and that's almost a given. Um, I don't want to, but we can we can look at some of the quotes of the famous people. Can I have those quotes on the display? Yeah. Yeah. Climate change knows no borders, and it will not stop before Pacific Islands and the whole of the international community here shoulders the responsibility. Can you jump to the second quote, last quote? Yeah. So the last quote is said by Dr. David Sir David Attenborough. We have been putting things off here. Uh, so I said, I'm not able to see the last quote due to some technical issues. Maybe we can okay, move on. Working. Okay, thank, thank you for that. What, what David Attenborough has said, who has been a climate observer, climate scientist, in nature lover, he has said that we are putting off action thinking that we can catch up. But he says the time is run out. We need to do something very serious. So uh, let me close by so-called introduction here. Let me just um, use this, use the other slides. Aditi, can you put those slides? Huh. So just to give a little kind of a feel as to what you are up to, the first session today will be about identifying interrelationship between climate, environment, and economy. Next slide. I see. The second session will be about low carbon economy and how that can benefit what we want to achieve. Yeah, uh, low carbon economy for green growth. Uh, the third session will be on changing energy dynamics for India. And the fourth session will be actually a panel discussion to search for a pathway for an environment economic policy. And this is how we are going to work towards this objective. Objective is to create an awareness for a proactive policy that can combine and synergize the environmental priorities with the economic priorities. So let me talk here, Siddharth, back to you. Thank you very much, sir, for setting the tone for the agenda of the conference. Each of these four sessions plays a significant role in the conference. So we will now start by introducing the first session. So in the first session, 
the interrelationship between environment and economics is what we're going to discuss. We will try to understand the implications of environment and economy being at crossroads and also moving away from that to building a maximum synergy among them. So I would now like to introduce our next, sorry, our first speaker. Allow me to, allow me to butt in and welcome my three invited speaker, Dr. Chirag Dhara, Dr. Ram Prasad Chan Gupta, and Dr. Um, Nulka. Okay, please go ahead. Yep. Welcome from- All right. Yeah. I would now like to introduce Dr. Chirag Dhara uh, for the first talk on environmental consequences of limitless economic growth. Dr. Chirak Dhara is a physicist and climate scientist currently working at the Indian Institute of Tropical Metropology. He's one of the authors of India's first comprehensive climate assessment report released in 2020 and is a contributing author to the next major IPCC report expected to come out in 2022. Thank you very much for joining us today. Over to you, sir. So that, thanks so much. And Professor Madan, Malik, uh, thanks to you as well. Uh, good evening, everyone. So let me share my screen. In this talk, I'm going to talk about the two major crises that uh, we humans have precipitated, the climate crisis and the ecological crisis, uh, and how they relate to our uh, economic system. The, both of these crises are so vast in their scale that it can be very hard to wrap our heads around it, to really understand what it means uh, to us as, uh, you know, not, not just in the global sense, but also us. So it's, it's, it's hard to visualize and personalize. And in the next two slides, I would like to do that, uh, try to do that. Uh, fair warning, they are going to be slightly jarring, but I, I think it's really useful to get a sense of what it is we are looking at. This here is a mummified body of a climate um, His company got buried in an avalanche 55 years ago before this photograph was taken, so in 1959. This photograph is from 2015. And these bodies, which have been buried for decades, have started to emerge from the snow and ice. And the reason that's happening is because of ice loss and glacial retreat because of global warming. Um, this is not an isolated phenomenon. Uh, the same reports are emerging from the Himalayas, the, the Alps. So all of this, it's, it's, it's a manifestation of the huge global problem that is uh, the climate crisis. Let's look at the next one here. This kangaroo baby uh, you will notice that its feet are bandaged. It was rescued from the Australian wildfires in 2020, which they were raging about uh, a year of, uh, uh, from today, year uh, before today. Uh, this was one of the luckier ones. Uh, more than a billion animals died in those wildfires, aside from, of course, the uh, major consequences for humans, for infrastructure, and so on. This these wildfires were record-breaking in their scope and scale and their intensity, and they followed one of the most extreme droughts in Australian history. And that is the sort of thing that is made much likelier, much more intense by global warming. Um, and it's easy to understand why. Uh, rising temperatures, dried out uh, soils, more intense droughts. You have a fire, it ignites, and it stays ignited. So why is all this happening? That's the content of this talk, and that's why the title, The Environmental and Other Consequences of Limitless Economic Growth. Of course, I haven't yet made the connection between what we've just seen, the images we've seen, which are manifestations of the larger problems, and our economic systems. So that's uh, what I'm going to do now. And for that, we need to take a detour and go into the human appropriation of the Earth's natural resources. Let's start with something which most of us are familiar with. This, what you're looking at here, is the last 200 years of um, global fossil fuel use. Um, these are global numbers. This is the entire uh, world uh, put together. Uh, this is roughly present day, and this starts from 1800. 
And you can see how our use of fossil fuels has increased dramatically, exponentially, um, in the true mathematical sense of the word exponential, rather than just a, uh, an English expression. And I would like to draw your attention in particular to the 1950s, where you can see a very steep uh, takeoff in the use. That's right after the Second World War. Um, metal production, global, once again, a curve which goes up exponentially uh, until, you know, for the last uh, 120 odd years. And once again, this uh, very clear takeoff after the Second World War. We can look into a whole host of these resources. This is a global plastics production globally um, in the last uh, 65 years. And we've gone up to 7 billion tons of plastic produced today. This is cumulative. That's why this, this curve looks so smooth. The fresh water use. Once again, you have uh, in the last 100 years, this exponential rise. There seems to be a slight flattening out here, but it's still rising at about 1% um, per year. Um, and the levels are already at 4 trillion meters cubed of water use. Land. Uh, the same, this is the cropland extent. And once again, the exact same phenomenon. And of course, as all of these physical resources, not just water and land, but also uh, metals, construction minerals, plastics, rubber, glass, you name it, paper, all of it growing exponentially, the natural consequences have been pollution. So here we are, what we are probably most familiar with, CO2 emissions uh, since the 1850s. Um, unsurprisingly exponential, uh, this is the, uh, by the way, for the entire world, not, not disaggregated by country or anything. And unsurprisingly exponential and unsurprisingly takes off very steeply right after the Second World War. Uh, you know, exactly what you would expect because fossil fuel use has been growing uh, extremely rapidly since then. But even the microplastic content in the surface ocean, you may have heard of this major problem we now have with uh, microplastics being all over the global uh, oceans. And uh, even that uh, has grown exponentially. We are using plastics um, in, you know, in, in, um, uh, in a huge way. It's not just contained in the products we use. We also use it to package the products we use. Now, why has this happened? That's the question, isn't it? Here's the fundamental reason. The world's economy, which is generally measured by the GDP, the global dom the, uh, domestic product, gross do domestic product, has grown exponentially ever since the Industrial Revolution. And that's what we are looking at over here. And might I point out that right here after the 1940s is this very steep takeoff, which has basically in being the root cause of all of these other resources taking off exponentially and steeply. Why is this? What this increasing world economy has enabled is wealth. And that wealth has given rise to ballooning consumption. It's all the stuff that we own, the appliances, the electronics, the food we eat, the junk food we increasingly eat, the way we travel, private transport, uh, flights, uh, what we wear, fa the fashion industry, all of it. Everything that you see over here comes from raw materials and um, the use of which has caused pollution. So what are the consequences of all this ballooning material growth? And for that, the more fundamental question we need to ask is, all of these products that we use, how do they come about? So let's sort of, break this down uh, and, and see how uh, these come about. So step one, raw materials that go into all of these products are extracted. And the way extraction normally goes is through mining. Whether you talk about coal, whether you talk about lithium, gold, silver, magnesium, tungsten, you name it. Uh, all of those usually come from holes in the ground or from uh, deep ocean mining. And in the process of making these mines, we invade and destroy natural habitats because typically where they sit, there are there used to be forests and we've destroyed those forests and all of the life that lived there, the wildlife, 
uh, ecosystems damage and destruction. Second step, we use these resources, these raw materials to build infrastructure. So things like uh, power plants from where we draw energy, things like um, our roads and rail for transport, uh, heavy and light industry to make the stuff that we use. Uh, once again, to construct all of these, um, all of this infrastructure, we once again destroy the ecosystems that were there before the infrastructure came by, before we built them there, by destroying the ecosystems there. And then of course, products are manufactured. So stuff like this. And in the manufacturing process, uh, very often we use uh, toxic chemicals or heavy metals, uh, which are uh, you know mercury and lead and so on, which are also very, very harmful to human health. Now, we use and dispose of these products, right? In that process, we create all of this pollution. You may, you may have heard that there are parts of the Pacific which are basically, they've got vast islands of floating plastic. They're basically a plastic garbage dump. Um, that, that's that's uh, that right there. Uh, and then of course, if we release uh, untreated uh, effluents, chemical effluents into water bodies that causes water pollution, we have landfills uh, and we have, you may, you may know that we have this whole huge problem of electronic waste, which is building up very hard to recycle. So then of course, the problem that is air pollution. And by that, I mean, not just particulate matter air pollution that we're all intimately familiar with in this country, but also greenhouse gases, which is what causes the climate crisis. Now I deliberately left out greenhouse gases for now um, because I wanted to point out, I would like to point out that greenhouse gas pollution, which causes the climate crisis, is just one of the many ways in which we are destroying um, the living world. Uh, although that's what finds most expression in the media these days. And so the consequences are the ecological and climate crises of our resource extraction, raw material extraction, uh, infrastructure construction, uh, product manufacturing, its use and its disposal in that order. Look at this, for example. Um, pollution in the water or, um, you know, stuff that we, nets and so on that we, uh, that get lost in the water, um, pollution on land, um, uh, you know, this uh, is a photograph of an oil slick which affects um, marine uh, wildlife, marine organisms. So all of this that you're seeing here is the human footprint, the human pollution footprint on the planet, which is destroying our wildlife and causing the ecological crisis. On the other hand, you have the climate crisis because of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, odd breaking heat waves, uh, or rather the uh, wildfires in Australia, there were also the record breaking wildfires in California, uh, which destroyed vast amounts of uh, vast tracts of land, of infrastructure. Uh, this was in California, North America, Let's come to this part of the world. And this, what you're looking at here is a photograph that a friend of mine took. This is a primary school in the Sundarbans, where the Ganga and the Brahmaputra uh, flow into the Bay of Bengal. This school was built very close to the coast. And four years back, the school was perfectly operational. And in just four years, the, bay, the sea levels in the Bay of Bengal rose so rapidly that the school is completely destroyed. And not just the school, the water has come in over 100 meters further uh, beyond the school and destroyed uh, all of the agriculture, agricultural land, uh, not to mention uh, dwellings uh, that existed there. So those people have become essentially climate refugees. Of course, the sea level rise in the Sundarbans, there are, uh, it, it's complex. It's not just sea level rise because of global warming, but also uh, for other developmental, quote unquote, developmental reasons, uh, uh, which have accelerated sea level rise in the Sundarbans. But the climate crisis is most certainly one of the important components there. Uh, sorry to burn in Chirag, but uh, yeah. 15 minutes are nearing up. 
Uh, yeah, one minute, right? I'm done. Uh, three, four slides. So the, the end of sort of all of these crises, to summarize, are a direct result of the fundamentally extractive nature of our economic system. As long as we have resource demand, and by resources, I mean all raw materials, okay? As long as it keeps going up exponentially, that's unsustainable. And if the pollution, soil, water, air pollution, keeps going up exponentially, that's unsurvivable. So the minimum requirement for genuine sustainability is that our resource demand has all, all of all resources must flatline. That's the only way you can make it make the system sustainable. And in addition, uh, all of the pollution must be extinguished to the extent that it can. Uh, and that is survivable. So this is what we really require. And yet the mainstream narrative, it mandates limitless economic growth um, uh, without any notion of sufficiency. And that's what um, poses one of the great challenges of our times now. Can an exponentially growing economy be sustained and yet we solve the climate and ecological crises? And if that is indeed the case, if we believe that to be the case, how would we do that? And that's going to be the theme of the rest of this conference. Uh, with that, I would like, you, like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Chirag, Dr. Chirag Dara, for such an insightful and uh, really uh, an eye-opener for all of us, I'm sure, or what kind of impact our activities are having on the environment. So next up, uh, we would have uh, the next session by Dr. Ramprasad Sain Gupta. So Dr. Ramprasad Sain Gupta is an Emeritus Professor of Economics at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. He has been visiting faculty to universities in India, USA, Germany, etc. and is a former advisor to the Planning Commission, Government of India. I now request Professor Sain Gupta to deliver his talk on environmental degradation and impacts on economic resilience. Thank you. Over to you, sir. First of all, I begin my discussion on the topic by referring to a few illustrative extreme events in the natural and human system as recently experienced. First is COVID-19 pandemic, a zoonotic disease pandemic. Second is recent super cyclones as like Amphan in, the, in our East Coast, which is unprecedented in terms of wind speed and devastation since 1737. And Nisarga on the West Coast, again unprecedented since 1891. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir, but we cannot see your presentation. Uh, I, I was talking about the super cyclones. First, I talked about COVID-19 zoonotic disease pandemic. This is one extreme event. Second is this recent super cyclones, heavy rainfall uh, and cyclone like Amphan in our East Coast, which is unprecedented in terms of wind speed and devastation since 1737. And on the West Coast, we had the experience of Nisarga, uh, which was also in a, 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 unpre again unprecedented since 1891. These are obvious evidences of climate change due to changes on, in temperature on land and sea. Then there are fire, forest fires, which have been experienced uh, in the recent past, say, particularly in the state of Uttarakhand. Thousand burning sites were there in 2019, although the numbers have now come down. But we have to uh, remember that global satellite data show, in fact, that vast tracts of land in Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, and Africa have been burning for quite a number of years. And we also know about in, in North America, how California uh, fires are you know, destroying, destroying the natural uh, world there. These illustrative events are in fact the expressions of the cumulative effect of environmental degradation as exceeding some threshold levels.
I'm now showing the figure, which is showing the total worldwide number of all kinds of extreme events, uh, disaster events as recorded as growing over time. From 1970, there has been a secular trend of rising these in number, this frequency till say around 2005. Then of course it has, there is a declining trend, but still there are fluctuations. All the countries, I now focus on this COVID-19 pandemic, which is currently we are in, all the countries in fact have been affected by this genetic disease pandemic and the socio-economic life has been derailed from its normal course everywhere. Among the countries, in fact, India has been in the second position as in November uh, last. The most notable uh, feature of this disease is its very fast spread. At the start of the lockdown in India, 25th March, the total number of confirmed cases was 563. And it spiked to almost 9 million on 19 November 2020. This reveals highly infectious nature of the disease and it is very fast uh, spread caused by highly non-linear behavior of the ecosystem and possibly the Heisenberg type uncertainty principle driving mutations and the growth of the virus or the concerned organism beyond our comprehension. We do not have possibly adequate APRI knowledge or and observations and it may be true that some of the concerned objects are not measurable due to the uncertainty principle. What is happening? I'm not being able to go to the next slide. Okay, I am. What has happened essentially is that global heating, climate change and destruction of the natural world uh, And the, uh, and the natural world due to deforestation and massive change of land use have driven wildlife into the contact with humans due to the, their loss of habitats. Consequently, the current rate of loss of biodiversity or land uh, in this age of Anthropocene is estimated to be 100 to 1000 times faster than during any of the preceding geological age before the arrival of the Homo sapiens. In the governmental platform of biodiversity and ecoservices, in its report of 2020, says that 1 million uh, animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades, uh, which is ever more than ever in human history. Many new zoonotic diseases like SARS, MERS, COVID-19, avian flu, swine flu, Ebola, uh, uh, Nile flu, etc., have emerged in the during the last 20 to 25 years. They are all linked to the transmission of microbes from animals and other life forms to human beings. I'm getting stuck with the time. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a graph which shows. Sorry, sorry, there is some problem. Yes, sir. What is the problem? Uh, now, now it is uh, resolved. I have to go out from that uh, pre presentation mode. All right, you can continue. Okay. okay. Fundamental driving factor behind all these has been the imbalance between carrying capacity of the biosphere and the human demand for its appropriation for economic activities or ecological footprint exceeding it. Ecological footprint is, the estimate, is estimated in terms of appropriation of photosynthetic land area required to meet various kinds of human demand for its uses, like crop production, grazing of livestock, forestry, fishing, carbon absorption due to fossil fuel burning, and development of industries, infrastructure, and township. These different types of land uses are normalized for aggregation in units of 
equivalent cropland area of average global photosynthetic productivity. The availability of land for such uses in similar normalized unit provides the needed of biocapacity and the excess of bioecological footprint over biocapacity is called the biodeficit. Now what is the situation for the entire world globally today? If this green line it be the one as the biocapacity, then the total ecological footprint has been growing since 1961 according to this, uh, this figure, the total the upper, upper contour of this uh, uh, figure, you know. Now these shades are different types of land use. Now the blue one, which is more than 50%, is really the carbon footprint, which is measured in terms of land area, which is required to absorb the excess of uh, emission over what land, vegetation, forest and ocean can absorb. And that if I convert in terms of additional required forest area, that is the shaded area. And that is why the carbon footprint is more than half of the total ecological footprint. And that is why climate change has become the most important factor so far as the ecological de degradation is concerned. <clears throat> the ecological footprint exceeded, in fact, the, the capacity as we noticed around the uh, early uh, 70s or late 60s. We now, in 2016, we needed 1.7 unit of art to ensure a balance between footprint and capacity. But one may question that how can the planet be a finite place? How can there be a biodeficit? How is it feasible? The biodeficit actually gets reflected in differential deficit for different types of use. And what happens is that market and state, the social preferences as reflected through the behavior of market and state, uh, in fact, ensures a transformation of the land use, change of land use. So forest land gets converted into agricultural land, forest and agricultural land into industrial and infra uh, land for in industrial and infrastructural development. Similarly, crop land, uh, similarly, water bodies, wetlands get also converted. But besides this, the overall deficit is reflected in the most important way in the deficit of photosynthetic forest area, which I called the carbon footprint. The notional measure, of the, it is a notional measure. There is no land area we can show that this is the carbon footprint. But the physical counterpart of this consequence has been the accumulation of CO2 and GAG molecules in the upper atmosphere. The environmental degradation actually started 10 to 12,000 years ago with the onset of the agricultural revolution and beginning of biodiversity loss and land degradation due to overuse of land and water. So this has started, the history is about 10 to 12,000 years. In fact, there was no environmental degradation in the, uh, there in the first 99% of human history when man was a hunter-gatherer. Now then, when the industrial revolution came, based on fossil fuel, it is this induced really the air pollution and global warming due to particulate and CO2 emission. So the consequence has been on the one hand, biodiversity loss due to land use change and zoonotic diseases. And secondly, the climate change due to carbon footprint. And this led to the, is leading to the cyclones, fires and devastation. But there is a third impact which we do not see physically, but which is there. There is a social impact, a huge social impact due to disparity between the rich and the poor because of the lack of adequate rights over the natural resources by the poor. The poor get a disproportionately smaller share of benefit of biocapacity in a situation of scarcity. This results in hunger, poverty, malnutrition, disease, and premature death. This is the gap between the ecological footprint and biocapacity. Biocapacity is a green one. This is for China and this gives how things are changing. Now, the severity of such impact of ecological imbalance on human system, however, is accentuated by the nonlinearity 
and complexity of the functioning of ecosystems. Most of human activities involving land use change cause fragmentation, first of all, fragmentation of ecosystems, and then biodiversity loss, and biodiversity loss reduces the resilience of the ecosystems in the event of any external shock. In the context of disease pandemic, biodiversity loss in fact creates niches for pathogens coming from animal bodies where they would be waiting, as if in the wings, in small numbers, to explode into large population whenever a suitable situation appears and then creates condition for the new pathogens to evolve through mutations as part of non-linear regeneration process. The very frequent mutations of the strains of COVID virus, like UK strain, as people are suffering in various countries, are the examples of such situation, which has been very challenging for our virologists and epidemiologists. But finally, the impact of global warming through non-linear process on climate change is becoming so serious that the next ice age is going to be postponed by 50,000 years, according to the Potsdam Institute of Climate Assessment. This just indicates signals the seriousness of the matter. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, to come in, but uh, your time is up. So could you please conclude your session? Well, I, I, I lost some time, I'm sorry. Uh, because of the, it got repeatedly stuck. Sure, and sir. Also, I had to repeat sir, certain things because I, 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 I could not feel that well. You are not being able to see. So please sure, sir. allow me to finish. Sure, there sir. Are a couple of more slides, that's all. All right, sir. Now, what should be the policy approach? The policy approach has to be that we have to be operating, economies have to be operating within the safe operating limit of world's ecosystems. That is zero ecological imbalance. Now, but the point is this, given the growth rate of global GDP per capita at the rate of 3.4% per annum and the rate of decline of global natural capital stock at the rate of 0.3% per annum as experienced during the periods in 1992 to 2014, such attainment of goal in the time frame of 2030, say, would require the global productivity of bioresources in terms of GDP to grow at the rate of 9.1% per annum. This is going to be too tall an order in view of the fact that the global productivity of such global productivity of bioresource has been increasing at the rate of 2.5% per annum over time. Now, if the productivity of natural resources cannot grow at such high rate, then what is the way out? The only way out is that we have to reduce the growth of both population and that of per capita income. But how can that be feasible? <clears throat> the reduction of growth rate requires a change in the preference structure of the society, a redistribution of income and wealth, and our ethical and value system. This would require change in mindset and our ways of thought our long-run policies for development of technology and resource use to optimize growth and redistribute the benefit of use of global biocapacity among the global rich and the poor. Finally, our policy initiatives and actions need to be combined with our genuine political will, which we are often lacking in fact, uh, and with our intellectual and emotional commitment to humanity for the universal and equitable sharing of rights to global resources for the development of all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for such an insightful presentation and a detailed presentation on the impact of uh, our activities on various biodiversity streams. Um, I would now like to move on to the next uh, presentation from Dr. Gurudas Nulka, which will be the last presentation for this session, after which we will take a question and answer session from the audience. So very briefly, um, Dr. Gurudas Nulkar is a sustainability expert 
He's a professor and head of the strategy and general management department at the Symbiosis Center for Management. He's a trustee and faculty at the Ecological Society at Pune. And I request him to give his talk on building synergy between environment and economy. This is where the first two presentations and this presentation comes together. So we look forward to your presentation, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. No, it's visible. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, um, uh, Pune International Center, as well as the entire team for inviting me in this. And I'm uh, uh, really overwhelmed by the, the earlier two speakers who had a very good stature in their own field. So I hope I'll be able to fill, fit into their shoes uh, somehow. Right. So I'm going to talk about building a synergy between the en environment and the economy and specifically on a kind of a model which I'm trying to build over. So it's, it's really a half cooked uh, model that I'm probably going, going to share with you today. So just bear with me that uh, it's not going to be exactly as I would like it to be seen. Um, and how am I going to do this? First, I'll talk about why do we not have a synergy today? And, and, and of course, there, be, there are a lot of arguments for the synergies, some of which Dr. Singh Gupta just shared with us. What tools are we banking on right now for the synergy? I will also talk about the caveats to the tools. Some of the caveats are not discussed in mainstream. Then I'll talk about the model which I'm trying to build, which is the synergy about how do we get there and enable us for synergy. Um, so the first and most important thing, why do we not have a synergy today? And I think there's a stark difference between the way ecologists operate and the way economists operate. So the botanists, zoologists really don't study economics. And exactly on the other side, economists are unaware of ecology and ecosystems and ecosystem services. Ecologists are mostly disinterested in national employment. You know, these figures of national employment, about livelihoods, about all these things, which the economist is concerned of. And the economist is very wary of qualitative indicators. He is very comfortable with numbers, statistics, data, something which he can process through um, a statistical program, but not very comfortable with qualitative indicators. The ecologist deals with geologic time scale. On the other hand, you know, the economist revels in quarterly results. He, he needs to look at how the economy is performing, how the financial data is coming every quarter, every three months. If there's a wide difference between a geologic time scale and quarter. Uh, so the ecologist is mainly working with non-linear and non-deterministic ecological futures. You know, if there is a change in the population of one species, you really cannot determine what will be the effect over a period of five years. On the other hand, economists are very comfortable with the deterministic future. And these are the uh, major differences. And thus, for ecologists, conservation equals to species conservation. On the other hand, conservation to an economist equal to an impediment to growth. If we say we let the forest of Molem be in their place, don't extract coal, then that's an impediment to growth. And therefore, they are continuously at orthogons. So ecologists view nature as a provider of resources and services, while economists view themselves as provider of human well-being. Well, at least that was supposed to be the intention early on during when um, early neoclassical economic thoughts was being developed. Therefore, the ecologists measure how do you maintain the physical and biological diversity of and ecosystem productivity. On the other hand, economists are mainly interested in maintaining economic growth and keeping a check on emissions and global warming. <clears throat> So in this slide, I, I, I want to say that it's not the entire fault of economists, but it's also about ecologists who need to look at the other side of the coin. So only if we are able to bring the ecologists and the economists together, can we achieve some sort of synergy in the environment and the economy. So the arguments for synergy, I'm not going to waste too much time on this. We have discussed this in detail, you know, zoonotic diseases, all those uh, climate issues and species issues, which uh, Dr. Chirag Dhara talked about, natural resource prices, you know, the prices are skyrocketing, they're growing every day, which tells you very squarely that the resources are depleting, you know, finite resources, when they deplete and the demand does not change, then the prices keep going up. So that's a very clear indicator of depletion of natural resources. Costs of pollution abatement, air, water, soil, all these 
renewable resources the cost that we are spending in as a uh, as a percentage of the tax collected by the government huge costs are being spent on pollution abatement just look at what happened in delhi recently you know we are uh, we are paying through our noses the taxpayer is paying through his nose for uh, improving the air quality healthcare expenditure you know healthcare has become one of the most profitable industries in the world today and that's simply because the healthcare is actually is the health industry and that's because the health is deteriorating uh, significantly wealth and income income inequality between and within nations is a very clear indicator depleting photosynthetic capacity you know we are no longer able to sequester as much carbon as we are producing we are no longer able to produce as much food i'm not just talking about humans but i'm i'm talking about the uh, the primary production of the planet which is uh, what photosynthesis gives that capacity has reduced global warming ocean acid you can add so many things to the list and you will still fall short of space so um, i'm just giving an indicator of, of the the arguments of that and what are the tools that we are banking on well there are two essential strategies and tools form the part of those strategies adaptation and mitigation so in adaptation we have various tools we have protection of vulnerable communities increasing carbon sinks emergency response and disaster management economic measures so many things which countries are, have already started doing for themselves and tools for mitigation we have price and non price mechanisms uh, which keep a check on carbon emissions which keep a check on methane and so many other greenhouse gases and uh, things like that which are polluting the non renewable resources we have low carbon economy which is more of a lip service today than any anybody doing anything about it the circular economy which is probably um, in some ways an extension of low carbon economy uh new measures like the human development uh, index we we are quite sure that the gdp is not a measure of human development neither for human well being so these newer measures are some of the tools that we are there are a lot of mitigation technologies like carbon capture and uh, methane capture uh, so many technologies which are coming up uh renewable energy so on and so forth and finally of course uh, international treaties which um, uh, like the paris agreement and so many other agreements which have come up in the history of climate change however there are serious caveats to the tools uh, both the kind of tools um, adaptation tools as well as the mitigation tools first and foremost i think that adaptation is a local and i would good which is it is country specific the benefits are going to come to the country to its people however mitigation is more of a global public good and that makes it very difficult for everybody to comply with you know the the, the rules of game theory can be applied when you are talking about a global public good and that's that's one of the chief causes of failure of a lot of treaties and a lot of agreements which we have uh, had um, till now the circular economy is a fine concept uh, but it has it it is uh, bestowed the 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 law of entropy imposes serious limitations upon the circular economy which we fail to realize when we are talking about circular economy the other thing is there are several negative externalities which remain unaddressed by any of these mitigation or adaptation tools that we are talking about today circular economy low carbon economy what have you that can change the trajectory of the rcp but it won't influence the shared socio economic pathways so this is a very key understanding that we have to keep in mind when we are talking about circular economy or uh, low carbon economy and thus current levels of energy and resource consumption must reduce if we wish to walk into a circular economy platform the most important thing which um, economists generally like to revel in is the general theory of equilibrium but the general theory of equilibrium where a mark, a aggregate demand and aggregate supply kind of balance each other clear each other is uh, cannot account for irrational behavior irrational behavior of human beings of individuals of societies of communities of businesses and the lure of financial markets so this is i think a very serious caveat to the low carbon and the circular economy and the most important is even if we consider a hypothetical situation where there is zero carbon emission and there is no global warming effect it still does not tell you that the life sustaining capacity of the planet will be maintained because the life sustaining capacity of the planet cannot be constrained to one indicator of co2 equivalent or one indicator of temperature rise 
it's such a non-linear and complex situation, the system that we are dealing with, we really have no idea about how we will work. So, so the, what is the current situation? Economy looks at a uh, provider of well-being and therefore nature, the economy looks at nature as a provider of inputs and a sink for the waste. Right, and therefore the, we have an economic measure, and we have an um, uh, um, we measure the uh, aggregate negative uh, externality by the CO2 equivalent or the temperature rise. The alternative economy must look at nature in a completely different way, and this is what I'm working on. And therefore, I said this is not yet a fully developed model, and yet there are some of my thoughts which you will see. So this the economy must look at nature as an operating system rather than a provider of inputs. Operating system of for life forms. This is not anthropocentric. This is humans and non-human beings and an operating system for the economy, which means it is certainly a provider of non-renewable and renewable resources, which are the inputs to the economy. But more importantly, it is also an enabler of life sustaining capacity and ecosystem services which are critically essential to economy right you know the hydrological cycle pollination germination primary productivity purification of water all of these services are the ones which are essential not just for sustaining life but also for the economy and finally security for future life forms right so this is what the sustainability definition um, is projected of um, the Brundtland commission you know for the generations to come but the generations to come are not just human generations they are also the generations of the insects of the cobra of the royal bengal tiger of the grand whale all of that and food and nutrition so the economy must look at nature in all of this and if any one of this is declining the economist must raise the red flag unfortunately this is not being done today so what do we do if we want to improve something we must uh, measure it and I, i'm calling these as synergy indicators we have to look at what we can measure in all of this so in renewable mess uh, uh, resources we could measure the quality and renewability of air water soil carbon sinks we can look at pollution abatement and healthcare spending as a proxy so that can be reduced from the gdp uh, in the renewable resources we could measure the resource stocks this is not very difficult to do a lot of countries are now aggregating their resource stocks distribution of natural resources so gini could be a proxy of how the resources are being distributed uh, in food and nutrition the health of soil changes in the microclimate now this is a serious concern for a lot of farmers especially in the uh, low rainfall areas who are not supplied by the dam waters that microclimates are changing and their agricultural productivity farm productivity is declining malnutrition and immunity is could be a proxy for food and uh, nutritional security the ecosystem services we have a lot of measures to measure them we are we can look at bio indicators you know there are keystone species the presence of rare endemic and threatened populations are they growing are they declining are they moving away are they changing you know what is the forest cover the species count and the populations the ecosystem productivity many of these measures are quantitative but some of them are qualitative uh, and finally the life sustaining capacity and the security for future life forms now this could be an index which is derived from other measures it should be much more comprehensive and a non anthropocentric like the hdi today the human development index has human in its title it's highly anthropocentric and if you want to have nature as an operating system you can no longer think only about human beings we have to look at other life forms preserving the integrity and security of an ecosystem is critically important to preserving the operating system for the life and nature and so coming back to the five capitals which are prescribed in sustainability literature the natural social and human capital and the produced and the financial capital me i am trying to say that the first three capitals should make up the net worth of the nation can we put a figure to it can we aggregate these capitals and then can we compete with another nation on the net worth of the nation not the gdp growth rate today we are competing with china and other countries on the rate of growth of gdp now this is a completely uh, false measure of anything that we know of instead the net worth are, are is the net worth of india increasing or declining compared to china compared to bangladesh com compared to countries which are in our um, zone so on and so forth and this must 
uh, we must measure the economic growth and the distributive efficiency there is no point in only measuring the economic growth and the distributive efficiency is uh, not up to the mark then you have a gini coefficient which is rising so challenges now how do we get there what are the challenges i know these measures are not fully complete and there is a lot of work to be done but first and the most important challenge is there is a poor agreement on these measures through scientific community through researchers and through economists second the measures do not originate in financial transactions which means they are hard to measure they are not very easy like the gdp qualitative measures can be subjective now this is a huge challenge but definitely artificial intelligence is something which can be used to remove the subjectivity from uh, the qualitative measures and it is not convenient in the current political system you know nobody wants to uh, uh, get hold of a measure which you cannot change or you cannot improve in a five year term because it hampers my, my vote bank into voting for me the next time but there are several advantages and the first advantage is it brings multidisciplinary thinking into development it's not just the economist who is guiding the development of the country but it's also the botanist of the ecologist the geographer the geologist the hydrogeologist so many others will need to come together for that second most important is these are lead indicators they are not lag indicators like the gdp this is not an x ray of what has happened but it can tell you what could happen in the future and economic growth is not considered a proxy for well being in this particular section so finally what could be my last slide what could be the enablers for reaching synergy i think the most important thing is revamping the agriculture and food sector i have purposefully divided agriculture and food sector separately because food comprises of nutrition and distribution of food and agriculture comprises of production of food now both of these systems are in dire need of changes in uh, in the country and they are squarely affecting uh, nature conservation and restoration in many more ways than one and this has been a forgotten sector second regional planning based on biogeography and agroclimate we have made a historical mistake when nehru was fascinated by the central planning model of khrushchev and stalin which originated in uh, soviet russia soviet russia is a country which is on one particular latitude well not one particular but it does not span too many latitudes india spans nearly 28 and a half latitude degrees latitude the the amount of sunlight reaching kanyakumari is completely different from the amount of sunlight reaching ladakh the rainfall in meghalaya is different from the rainfall in kutch we have such a diverse climate how can we have one central planning it has to be a regional plan based on biogeography and agroclimate participative decentralized democracy is what so many people have been talking about right from gandhian times unfortunately this has not seen the light of the day at all due to various reasons activation of cprs the common pool resources this is very important the tribals have a greater benefit in conservation than you and me who are sitting in cities and doing that traditionally we have used a lot of common pool resources you know forest food fisheries non timber forest produce grazing watershed underground water surface water so many of them had been common pool and they are now completely centralized into central governance restoration and conservation economy now this economy has a huge potential to create jobs for the least educated people and most importantly this economy is capable of conserving traditional knowledge it it does not require data analytics and business analytics and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning it requires grassroots knowledge of what is happening between seasons and within the times of the day that's what was uh, conservation and restoration economy is and finally i want to say that you know this was a famous sentence which indira gandhi said in the 1972 stockholm conference she said that poverty is the greatest polluter and i'm i'm trying to say that poverty is not the greatest polluter affluence is the greatest polluter and that is what we should be doing we are turning our economy into um, a, a, an economy feeding the affluent can we turn it into an economy feeding the people not just the affluent right so that brings me to the end of my presentation thank you so much thank you very much dr gurudas nulka we that was a really comprehensive presentation on how we can achieve synergy in this new economic model that we all want to try and achieve and also how we can tweak our economic model by identifying different red flags that are currently in place to achieving our goal so we're currently short on time so we're just going to take uh, one question from the audience uh we have a question coming in from uh, mr praful patel the question i think is more suitable for you gurudas sir 
uh, yeah. what are the economic business models that are currently working in india which show that sustainable economic growth with sustainable and regenerative ecological growth are working um so i think i i should uh, lead you to a website on which uh, one of uh, our friends is working on and that is called vikalpa sangam and the uh, the person who is in charge and the institution which is in charge for that is kalpa vriksh and ashish kothari is the name of the person so he has a collection of many such local decentralized economies which are in place and are actually thriving in in a sense which is not the economic sense of thriving but in a sense of thriving of well being to the people and there are very small um, examples located all across india and they would completely be different uh, as per the geography so uh, the examples from northeast would be different from the examples in kutch would be different from telangana and that's uh, that's what is very important in this i do not see anything which is happening on an, on the industrial or the economic scale as the business sector scale in india there's been a lot of talk with, with cii and fiki and maratha chamber of commerce are doing about circular economy and low carbon economy but there is no provision till today which is enabling this sector you know we have to revamp our taxes the gst is not suitable for take back laws and reuse and recycle kind of things uh, uh, which industries can do so we need a huge overhaul even in the taxation structure to enable uh, an economy which reuses and recycles stuff Thank you very much, sir, for the uh, very detailed answer to the question. Um, we will now move on to one of uh, our members of ECC Vertical, uh, Ms. Aditi Kale. Uh, she is currently heading the ECC Vertical uh, under Professor Amitav Malik. So, yeah, here it is. Uh, we will now look at. I request uh, Aditi to please share her slide and talk a little bit about the work that ECC is doing. Thank you, Sudha. I'll just share my presentation. Okay. So, is the presentation visible? Yes, we can see it. Oh, thank you. So, I'll just uh, shortly take you to the uh, EECC journey, which started around two years ago. Um, the EECC project has basically has two main aims. One is policy research, public policy research, and second is increasing awareness and creating a citizens' movement around sustainability, climate action, and uh, synergy between uh, the recent uh, objective which we've taken up is finding synergy between environment and economy. The pro our project is led by Professor Amitav Malik, who is the founder member and trustee of Pune International Centre. And it aims at creating a knowledge exchange platform for climate action. With a, the, although the perspectives included are global, national and local, uh, we are only geographically based in Pune. And we are also collaborating and advising with policy makers and officers on uh, various problems they encounter while uh, executing these concepts. Uh, we also interact with different groups, forums and initiatives to organize different events or uh, help them uh, in their own initiatives. And uh, simultaneously, we have formed a group called Climate Collective Pune, which is a group of like-minded people. I'll elaborate more on it uh, in a while. Uh, so the, the initiation of this project was uh, on 12th May 2018 when the uh, Pune International Center organized a workshop on climate literacy, where uh, the focus was on what platforms and how what actions will can initiate the climate action talk within Pune and then how to make Pune a carbon neutral city. Uh, in continuation to that, after one year of research, we published a paper called uh, Making Pune Carbon Neutral by 2030, a policy roadmap. Uh, just to summarize, uh, but the reason why the roadmap is a smaller uh, of of 10 years and not more is uh, kind of was summarized by our chief guest at that time uh, the environment minister of maharashtra mr aditya thakre so to quote him he said that for my generation if i have to survive for the next 50 100 years in a very happy peaceful and healthy way it cannot be in a situation which is a climate emergency so the uh, we 
try to call someone who represents the people and who represents the youth who are actually going to suffer the consequences and if you want to look at the report you can please visit the pune international website or climate collective website or contact us for the details although it aims at pune the measures which are given are actually uh, suitable to many countries uh, many cities if they want to take up this initiative um second initiative second part of our outreach is we every year we organize a event dedicated to climate change on environmental day which has a video presentation and some unique event like panel discussions or a special report release which happened in 2019 the recent one was a, a series of three climate dialogue climate economics dialogues the details of which will again be can be seen at the ccp website uh we also try to engage youth because it's their future which is at stake and uh, also because uh, they are facing very different narratives and consequences than what was earlier and uh, to help empower them in their actions and in their career uh and uh, we are uh, also promoting our work on social media uh, uh social media through this platform called climate collective pune which is a group of like mind like minded people from ngos and companies who have come together to spread climate awareness and also to realize meaningful climate action with a view to make pune carbon neutral by 2030 Uh, so i uh, one of the main initiatives within the climate collective pune website is the carbon footprint calculator which has been designed by dr priyadarshini karve and it uh, helps you to calculate the uh, carbon footprint of your household and also in which sector the footprint is higher so that you can uh, ha have have the capacity uh, find out measures of how to reduce your own carbon footprint and we are also available over uh, social platforms like facebook twitter instagram and linkedin so please stay connected and uh, let us continue this dialogue in this conference and after it as well thank you thank you so much aditi for giving the audience a brief idea of the work that ecc is doing I wholeheartedly thank Dr. Chirag Dara, Dr. Ram Prasad Sen Gupta, and Dr. Gurdas Nulka for giving a wonderful insight into the first session. Um, I would now like to share a couple of videos from uh, ex-members of ECC who have now gone ahead and built wonderful careers uh, ahead. So I would just like to share a video here from one of our ex-members called Manasi Kutwal. Hello fellow change makers in the climate space. I am Manasi an SPI Youth for India fellow and I've been working with Dhan Foundation in the rural parts of Tamil Nadu for the past 4 months. I am working in a slightly urban block called Kotampatti which is to the north of Madurai with two panchayats. This work includes understanding and executing development solutions for the creation of inclusive governance institutions. While my project's principal theme is self-governance, my focus is on water and agriculture since this region is gravely affected by erratic monsoon and unsustainable cropping patterns. The connection of these issues present to climate change is evident to me because of my experience of working with Professor Amitabh Malik and the ECC team. water stress and the cultivation of water intensive crops like paddy has not only aggravated the livelihood issue here but also the health concerns these connections between climate change impact and economics and health were not obvious to me during my undergraduate studies as i never came across a connection between a fairly theoretic subject like economics and a dynamic discipline like climate change It is only while interning with EECC that I was introduced to this less discussed connection between economics and environment. 
the opportunity to co-author thoroughly researched policy advocacy papers and conduct such outreach programs has encouraged me to look at development issues through a holistic lens. This path of evaluating development issues is guiding me right now and I'm certain that it will in the future too. I see climate change as an enveloping problem with economics and politics integral to deciding the survival of humanity. Unless and until I see the climate side of the problem, I am not creating sustainable solutions is what I have realized through my limited experience in the field. This approach is what I hope to carry forward while venturing into the development, development sector. Thinking about climate and economics differently means adopting a myopic view, which any individual determined to survive should not make a mistake of holding. Thank you. That was a great insight into one of our ex-members, Ms. Mansi Kutwal. I will now share a brief a video from one of our ex, another ex members. Um, there we go. Mr. Nishit, Nishit Shukla is currently based in Bangalore. He is doing excellent work in getting together entrepreneurs and uh, policy makers into one frame. So here's an insight into Nishit. Hi, my name is Nishit Shukla and last year I worked with the Energy, Environment and Climate Change team in Pune International Center. What we did was an, a six to eight month effort to design a public policy paper to make, to figure out on how we can make Pune a carbon neutral sweaty city in the next 10 years. Um, what I worked on was specifically figuring out the scope one and scope two emissions uh, of Pune metropolitan region and we use that data to figure out what is the best way to create interventions to reduce these emissions as much as possible. So that was my work last year and today I work as an entrepreneur, I work as a consultant and I work as a community builder to figure out how can uh, co-working professionals and entrepreneurs bridge the gap between intention and action in the climate action space. Uh, while this defines the work that I do today, uh, I would like to speak about the purpose behind which I do whatever I do, right? So today, I, I truly believe that the conversation on climate change is not simply about the mass extinction of uh, all species, or it's not just about uh, the tipping points causing irreversible change. Uh, for me, it actually uh, comes back to the crossroads that where humanity is, uh, we're at a place where we can either be called nefarious exploiters or the responsible guardians of the planet, right? And I believe that we as a humanity have immense potential to overcome the most destructive aspects of ourselves. So I am personally working towards that because I deeply believe in that purpose. Um, and that's the work that I continue to do um, throughout my career and throughout my lifetime. Thank you. So that was a small insight into Nishit. Uh, we will now be shortly taking a break, but before the break, I'd just like to announce that uh, in case we have missed your questions, please write them uh, to our Gmail account. We will try to answer them as much as possible. Uh, so the next session is going to start exactly in nine minutes at 5.30 p.m. and it is on low carbon growth and green economy. So please stay tuned. This is where everything comes together that has been said in the first session. And I'm sure this is a session that's going to give us a good insight on how we can balance economic aspirations with the industry and move forward. So we will now take a break and see you again at 5.30 p.m. I request you all please not to log out. Please stay logged in for this session uh, and for the sessions coming up and uh, see you soon at 5.30.